Hello and welcome to Ready for Disaster. I'm your host, Dave Irick. No matter where you live, disasters, natural and otherwise, are an unfortunate yet inevitable part of life. The one preventable, there are ways to minimize the impact these disasters have on our lives and our families. Now, let's get ready as my co-host, Jennifer Ann Wilson, takes you on an in-depth look at the issues that directly affect Southern Californians. Every part of the country has natural disasters specific to the region. The Southeast has hurricanes, the Midwest gets tornadoes, and here in Southern California, we have earthquakes. Though we may feel minor tremors on a regular basis, very few of us have actually experienced a major earthquake. The scientists are predicting the largest earthquake in California history will happen in our lifetime. Though we can't predict when it will come, we can prepare for when it does. How much do you know about earthquakes? Let's find out. What device is currently used to measure the magnitude of an earthquake? Seismograph, Richter scale, modified Mercalli intensity scale, amplification scale. Stay tuned for the answer as Jennifer takes us from Pasadena to San Diego interviewing the leading earthquake experts. Earthquakes are perhaps the most mysterious of the natural disasters. Perhaps it's because there are no warning signs or because it takes place beneath the ground. Regardless, there is one place and one person who isn't quite as in the dark about earthquakes as the rest of us. I'm here today at the California Institute of Technology to interview Dr. Kate Hutton, one of the world's leading seismologists. She'll be shedding some light on the subject of earthquakes. How often are there earthquakes? Well, we have earthquakes every day. We do? But most of, every them, day? most of them are too small for people to feel. Yeah, we have earthquakes every day. We have probably 100 a week minimum. We have 100 earthquakes a week? Yeah. I had no idea we had that many. Have earthquakes increased? Or are, are they on the increase? Or is this pretty no, average? No, I think the number that are reported are on the increase because we have um. a lot more stations now. Yeah. We have a lot of news media to report the earthquakes. Okay, but I don't think the average rate of earthquakes is changing. I think okay. on on the time scale of decades, centuries, it's pretty positive. The reason we have so many earthquakes is that we're on the boundary between two large pieces of the Earth's crust, the North American plate and the Pacific plate. And they're moving with respect to each other because heat is escaping from the Earth, you know, from its formation four and a half billion years ago, right? Um, and the plates are sliding at about an inch per year so that it doesn't slide smoothly. It holds up strain until it breaks. Hmm. And then you have a little offset and it builds up strain again. And, it and so every time it warm. breaks, okay, is so, that an earthquake? So every time it breaks, the motion of the, of the rock sends out these waves that we feel as an earthquake. You said there's 100 earthquakes a week? About. At minimum. At minimum? Yeah. So you're working in the seismology lab and you see an earthquake coming. Are you on the edge of your seat every time? I mean, how do you know it's not going to get bigger? How do you know it's going to stop where it stops? Well, we don't actually sit here and like work <laughs> okay. with the machines all the time. The okay. computers do that, oh. right? And if it's bigger than a certain size, it sets off our pager. If it started somewhere else, like down in Imperial Valley, we would, it would take some time for to reach. It wakes, waves to get up here. And do you still use the Richter scale? Uh, we do, uh, but in a modified fashion. It's all in the computers. Right. And the computers do all this. <laughs> so you no longer have the little dial in them? No, we don't have any uh, of the paper recordings anymore because the pens are not available anymore. <laughs> we really? had to make them by hand. <laughs> you did? You made them by hand? Well, not me personally. Oh. But, uh, we, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that's not very dense storage of data, right? I mean, we right. had a warehouse full of paper. Paper, right? <laughs> they were sheets because oh, okay. they were. They were uh, put around the drum and then taped, and then the, it was like a, a helical recording. Okay. But we had this back to 1927. Now, is there a certain time of the year or a certain time of the month? Nope. No. There's, there's controversy, there has been controversy about um, the stress caused by the moon, moon phases. You know, okay. Uh, when the moon, it, full moon or new moon, when the moon is pulling the same direction as the sun is, then it might be 
the magnetic the forces well, no, might be uh, gravitation. Gravitation, not magnetic. Okay. Uh, might put a little bit more strain on the crust, but it is a little bit compared to the tectonic strain. One thing we do see is uh, earthquakes can can trigger other earthquakes, mm -hmm. and that's what aftershocks are. Really. I mean, it's like the first shock happens, and it changes the whole strain in the crust. Usually more are right, right around the main shock, but to some distance. I have heard before that California will one day fall into the ocean. Is that a myth? Is yeah. it? Yes. <laughs> I was just going to say that, you know, when I first started working here at Caltech, we got this a lot. Uh, you know, people said, oh, no, California's going to drop off. And other people said, well, the East Coast is going to drop off, right? But actually, I, you know what, I think the, the, the myth came from the term continental shelf. The, the ocean is a little bit more than full, okay? So it, the, it's pretty shallow out to a certain distance before it drops off, okay? And this flat part is called the continental shelf. Mm -hmm. Just because it's flat, not because there's space underneath it. Okay. <laughs> but some people probably thought there were Russian submarines going well, around underneath the continental shelf. Or sure. You know, and, and it's not true. And so they can't fall off. Okay. It's not gonna fall off. Good to know. But what it is doing is it's moving northwest. So in 15 million years, we'll be up by San Francisco. Can you define magnitude for me and how it's different from the intensity, or is it different? It is different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, magnitude is based on the instrumental readings. Okay. And uh, you just say, uh, how big would the amplitude on the record be 100 kilometers away from the epicenter of the earthquake? And ideally, there's one magnitude for the earthquake. Ideally. Yeah. Well, you know, you may have people estimating it different ways, and they may mm -hmm. get different values. But the idea is that that's sort of like the wattage of a light bulb. It's the size of the earthquake. Okay. Whereas with intensity is a map. Oh, okay. the and distance shows, it covers. And it shows the, the shaking as a function of the location. Okay, so that would be more useful to um, emergency services people, for example. Okay. Because they can see where the damage would, is likely to be. Is there any way to prevent an earthquake? I don't think there is any way to prevent an earthquake, but there's a ways to prevent the damage. Okay. In other words, we can build um, buildings that are designed to withstand earthquakes, and we can uh, secure objects, you know, the contents of the buildings and so forth, so that they're not uh, that vulnerable. A seismograph is the actual device that scientists use to measure earthquakes. The more commonly known term, Richter scale, is a logarithmic scale used to compare earthquakes. For example, an earthquake that measures 4.0 on the Richter scale is 10 times larger than the one that measures 3.0. Well, you can't prevent an earthquake, you can prevent the damage, but how? Well, I didn't know, but I had to find out. So I invited earthquake preparation specialist Donna Finley over to my home to teach me how to be earthquake ready. Here we are, this is my house. And as I mentioned to you, I moved here from Michigan mm -hmm. six years ago and don't know much about earthquakes, but uh. that last one really shook me up. <laughs> so I need your expertise, Donna, in helping me be earthquake ready. Let me show you the very first thing I noticed, and it's this china cabinet. Okay. This is a very heavy piece of furniture, and it's not secured to the wall. And so when those powerful waves from the earthquake hit, it could catapult this china cabinet all the way across. You have a safety hazard. It's gonna block the door and it's gonna hurt you. That's what's gonna cause injuries. Secure it at the top and okay. nobody can see that. No. And I would even secure it down here too, okay. twice. And on the other side, both. As well. Now Jennifer, I yes. want you to look over at that wall and uh -oh. tell me, what do you see? That could uh, fall down and injure someone. That vase looks really dangerous. Want to lose that vase? No. Okay. And what do you think if you were sitting here and that came and if it hit you on the head, uh, probably would hurt some? Yes. Okay. So this and this one okay. have got to be secured. Okay. All right. The vase on top yeah. we secure afterwards. And as a rule of thumb, all right, if you have something on top of whatever piece of furniture, you can't just secure that vase without securing whatever is on it. Any heavy painting, mirror, 
anything like this on that you hang on the wall needs to be secured. Looking over here. Yes, our right. huge screen TV. This definitely, definitely, definitely needs to be secured. This can be secured with straps that are made for electronics, for even refrigerators, for microwaves, for TVs, that you can strap to this and then strap it around and then secure that into the stud of the wall. So Donna, I have got my work cut out for me. Just a little, not too much. <laughs> okay, well I'm gonna get to it and I will see you in a week for reinspection. I can't wait to see how you did, so in a week. See you in a week, bye-bye. My pleasure. All right, Brian, so I just had my home inspected for earthquake safety and it didn't pass. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, me too, but that's why I came to you. Here at Quake Hold, you guys are the earthquake specialist. I know you can help me out. I'll tell you what, we have the world's biggest mobile earthquake simulator right here. Let's go inside and I'll show you what you need to do and why you need to do it. Sounds great. Okay. Come on in, Jennifer. Okay. All right. Holy smoke! This is the inside of the big shaker. And right now what we're going to do is we're going to set it to a magnitude of about 4, 4.4, 4, something like that. Hills. So get yourself set. Okay. I'm getting out. All right, I looked through two earthquakes now, so I think I can handle this one. No problem. All right, so how'd you feel? That was fun. Fun? Yeah. <laughs> That's not the idea. Okay, okay, we're gonna crank it up a little bit more All for right. you. Maybe uh, between a five and a 5.5 .5 this time. Okay. okay. I'll leave it to you. Okay. All right. Well, those two shakers were actually moderate earthquakes. Oh, I felt that last uh, one. I know, but it was really only a moderate one. Okay. What the scientists are telling us these days is that we're going to get at least a 7.8, perhaps even bigger, somewhere on the San Andreas Fault. It might start at the southern end and work its way north. It might be in reverse. Either way, they say it's going to happen within our lifetime, and it could last for as much as three minutes or possibly wow. more. So what we're going to do now, and I'm not going to be in here to do it, by the way. I'm getting out again. We're going to rock it to at least a 7, 7.5, somewhere around there. Oh my and gosh. you're going to understand about the benefits of taking the time to secure things in your home. So brace yourself. Okay, thank you, Brian. I'm gonna put this on. <laughs> oh. Oh my gosh. So, like I said. And that was how many seconds? That was probably 10 at And at this most. is going to happen for three minutes. You can imagine the devastation that could cause. So I, I, we did notice that a couple of these things never moved off the shelf. Right. The things on the shelf that didn't fall have the quake called putty underneath them, <sighs> which is temporary adhesive. It's removable and reusable. You can use it over and over again. Uh, the other things have some sort of furniture straps on them. Okay. We have the this? amazing picture hook. Holy yeah. smokes. This could have fallen over it if could've. it hadn't been for the strap. Right. I need to get some of these supplies. Yes, you can do. You so does everybody. I think we can manage that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Brian introduced me to earthquake survivor and quake hold inventor Dran Reeks, who gave me everything I needed. Okay, Jennifer, the very first thing that you need is the Quake Old Museum putty. And what this is for is for securing all the antiques and collectibles, the little items that you have around your house. I have a lot of those. Yeah, and th these are the things that uh, take flight in an earthquake and are the number one cause for injury. And I want to give you this because I want you to hold that. There are a few other items that you also need. Okay. Uh, the other one is the, the amazing picture hook, and this secures all your... Uh, pictures uh, on the wall so that they don't fall off and into your escape routes when you're trying to uh, move from one room to the other in an earthquake. This will handle all of your large furniture. This is a must-do because, you know, even if you use the quake hold putty to secure the uh, shelves and to secure the collectibles, if your cabinet falls over, that's a problem. So you want to secure okay. that. In addition, we always recommend televisions, but now that we have the new flat screen televisions, oh, there is we have one for both one. the old and the new and oh. the big screen. 
screens. This is very simple. Again, everything is peel and press to the furniture and very, very simple to use. This right here is for shutting off the gas in your home. Oh. So you need to have this. And this is a very simple, low cost unit that just attaches right to the uh, gas main in your home. Really? You can secure the entire contents of your home for under $50, the cost of one meal out. That's a really and great. earthquake prepared. Thank you so much. I feel so much better and I'm really looking forward to getting home and putting these products to use. I can't <laughs> wait to see what you've done. Oh, perfect. Absolutely. Anybody can sleep safe on this sofa couch. Oh, great. Oh, that's perfect, Jennifer. What about the vase? Well, the vase is nice and secure. The putty's amazing. Yep. And these bookshelves are also strapped in quite firmly. And I got really concerned about the electronics after we spoke, yep. so the strap oh, is this protecting looks, my television. This looks great, Jennifer. This is absolutely oh, perfect. Oh, good. Have yes. I passed the inspection? Oh, completely. A plus. Let me tell you, Jennifer. You are so far ahead of the game than the average person when it comes to preparing for an earthquake. Part of living with earthquakes is living with aftershocks. Earthquakes come in clusters. In any earthquake cluster, the largest one is called the main shock. Anything before it is a foreshock, and anything after it is an aftershock. It's high noon, and there's a gunk fight at the Oil K Corral. I'm Sheriff Wyatt Oil, and I'm serious about oil recycling. When you dump used oil into the ground or storm drains, it's not absorbed, and you can hurt a lot of wild critters. That's why at the Oil K Corral, we recycle at one of our local businesses. And you city folks can buy refined oil made from used oil that's just as good as new, and usually cost a lot less. Become a partner with the City of Irvine. Recycle your oil today. Despite your education and your preparation, that earthquake is eventually still going to come. Here's what to do when it does. Eileen, tell me what to do when an earthquake strikes. If an earthquake struck right now, what would we need to do? You and I would both have to drop down onto the floor, go under this desk, and hold onto the leg of the table. So we don't want to put our fingers on top of the table holding on. No, you don't <laughs> want to do that, no, because okay. things are going to fall onto your fingers and then you're going to get injured. Now, is there a specific, easy to remember phrase, like the stop, drop, and roll? Yes. Drop, cover, and hold on. So you'd want to hold on to the leg of the table. This table's pretty heavy, but if it's a, a lighter table, you would want to go with it because you want to make sure that you're covered. Now, what if I am not in a building? What if I'm outside? Okay, if you're outside, basically what you want to do is don't run back inside. Right? You want to go away from the building, get out of the area, try to get it to a place that's safe and clear. For example, you wouldn't want to go into high wires. So you want to be into an area that's clear. Drop down and you can cover. Now, what if I'm driving when an earthquake strikes? Okay, if you're driving, basically what you want to do is get over to the side of the road, shut your car off, and stop, stay in there until the shaking stops, okay? If you're on an overpass, you probably want to get off the overpass if you possibly can do that. But you don't want to get out right away. You want to check and look around, make sure that you don't have any wires falling down on you or something like that. Because if there are wires, you want to stay in your car until you can get some help. Okay, great. So when an earthquake begins, what is the key thing I need to remember? You need to remember that you kind of have to stay where you are, okay? You don't want to be running in or running out of buildings. Basically, what you want to do is to get to a clear area, or if you happen to have a desk or a table near you, you want to drop, cover, and hold on. What device is currently used to measure the magnitude of an earthquake? Seismograph, Richter scale, modified Mercalli intensity scale, amplification scale. The answer is seismograph. Now we've covered most of the ways to prevent unnecessary damage from an earthquake. But what happens when an earthquake finally does hit? What do you do then? Up next, Jennifer has a heart-to-heart -heart with an earthquake survivor. We'll hear firsthand what the experience was like, how she dealt with it, and what she wished she had done differently. 
We'll also learn how to inspect our homes post-earthquake and make sure it's still safe to enter. Don't go anywhere. This next interview, you won't want to miss. According to a recent survey, 33% of those interviewed said their household had not practiced and or implemented an emergency action plan to execute when a disaster strikes. It was an experience unlike anything I've ever been in and have ever been in since. It was a big one and um, it was devastating to the whole city of, of Los Angeles. And I was in Hollywood and I'm trying to, the epicenter was out in Silmar, okay. but it might as well have been right underneath my feet. All I know is that I was shaken awake and I, did, I was stunned because you don't really know how to react when something of that magnitude comes upon you so quickly but I do know that I couldn't get out of bed even if I wanted to get out of bed and I did try to get out of bed and now I know um, from experience uh, and uh, that you need to stay in bed so fortunately by the grace of God I stayed in that bed <laughs> against my will but I did try to get up and it was impossible to get out of bed because the force of gravity had pushed me into the bed. What was going through your mind? Did you know what it was? The end of the world. I thought it was the end of the world. And you really don't grasp the fear that just reeks through your body at the same time you're trying to fight against it. Mm -hmm. What is going on? You do feel you have this thought in your mind that maybe I'm going to die. This is the last. And I wanted to see my mom. I wanted to get from my room to my mom and to my sister. My sister was crying in the back room. She yeah. was screaming. She was screaming. My mom couldn't get to her, and I couldn't get to her. And then it settled just the same way as it started, just ended. Suddenly. And I got out of bed, and everything in the house was completely trashed. There wasn't anything on the shelves. TVs were, were gone. Uh, it was chaotic. This experience seems to have made a huge impact on you. Oh, it was out of control. Here's the thing. You realize in your life that there are some things that you cannot control. And you need to have, you need to be prepared in your heart for the worst. You need to be prepared uh, with your home. I now know, because I have children now, that I want to be able to get from one room to the next, if the Lord willing that I am able to get out of bed, and we have actually practiced earthquake drills in our house. My children are completely aware, stay in bed, put a pillow over your head for the falling debris because that helps with things that might be falling on you. I have a light stick by their bedside just in case all the electricity is out and all those things you plug in don't work. So um, we have some preparation done in the house. We've also gone around our house now and we have what's called safe spots. It doesn't matter where they are in the house, when there's an earthquake, they, they know where they can go in each room. And I, I implore families to take this kind of action. It's very simple, it's actually quite fun. You can take your kids and go, okay, there's a good table, or that's a nice um, you know, cabinet to get behind. And of course, taking all the preparations like securing the, the uh, objects that you have from flying all over the room, because I know that had that earthquake occurred when we were up, and it had occurred when we were sitting in the living room where all of those things, the bigger objects, were available to fall on us. There would have been certainly somebody injured. I, if anybody has ever been in an earthquake, <laughs> one like that, they will know, get prepared because this will come out of nowhere and it will strike at any time and you don't want to be kept, you know, caught unaware. Everyone should have a personal disaster supply kit. Keep them where you spend most of your time so they can be reached even if your building is badly damaged. The kits will be useful for many emergencies. Now that you know how to prepare your home, it's time to build a seven-day emergency kit. Though your home may have withstood the earthquake with very little damage, necessities such as electricity, water, gas and roads may be unusable for several days or weeks following a major earthquake. As we've seen from past disasters, it can take the government up to a week to bring in the necessary aid. So it's very important that you and your family have what you need stored in case of such an emergency. We suggest that you purchase a sturdy barrel from your local hardware store and pack it very specifically. 
The very bottom of the barrel should have cash and personal documents in a secure, waterproof, fireproof container. Next, personal supplies like a towel, soap, and deodorant. Then, matches, candles, flares, an axe, shovel, can opener, and disposable eating utensils. Finally, bedding and a change of clothing per person. The middle of the barrel should include a seven-day food supply of non-perishable items and two gallons of water per person. Top off the barrel with a first aid kit, first aid handbook, pocket knife, sterile bandages and adhesive tape, flashlight, and radio, and a seven-day supply of prescription medication. Don't be a casualty of the disaster. Be prepared. Scientists and engineers place instruments and structures to measure how they respond to the motion of the ground beneath during an earthquake. Every time a strong earthquake occurs, the new information gathered enables engineers to refine and improve structural designs and building codes. The state of California updates their building codes every three years, incorporating things learned from past earthquakes. So your home is very structurally safe, but still, it's very important to know how to inspect your home post-earthquake to make sure it's still safe to enter. Deputy Building Official Joe Kirkpatrick is here to show us how. So we're in a real construction site right now, Joe. Right, this is a, a house that's in the rough frame stage. And the reason this is a good place to talk about seismic issues or earthquake uh, design is you can see how the elements go together. Great. This is a shear wall, the back of a shear wall. And at the base of that shear wall are anchor bolts uh -huh. and hold down anchors on either end. Okay. Uh, what is important to see here is that this is all connected. And so you could develop a crack at the bottom of the wall here mm -hmm. that would be superficial in nature, but as long as the wall relative to the foundation doesn't move, that connection is likely still in place, still doing what it's supposed to do. So once it's covered with drywall, how are we gonna know if it's out of place? Well, you would know because uh, where the wall lines up with the foundation here um, would be different if, okay. if it were offset. Uh, these anchor bolts really don't have a lot of give. So if there's any difference between the way the wall looked before an earthquake and after an earthquake, this connection is likely going to be deteriorated. Okay. Well, what I wanted to show you is this uh, significant uh, structural element here. Yes. This is a beam that carries the second floor, second floor floor load and it frames into a column here. As long as these elements are in place, the structural integrity or purpose of this structure is, is being met. That makes sense. Um, in an earthquake, this joint up here will likely show some cracking, but as long as there's no relative movement, there wouldn't be anything to worry about. Uh, the same thing would apply to the framing elements behind this beam, oh, yeah. which I'll show you more of in just a second. These are floor joists, and the floor joists frame into this beam over here, and they sit on top of the wall over here. And again, this is a location where you're likely to see cracks in a, after an earthquake, but again, as long as there's no relative separation between the floor joist and this beam, okay. the uh, hardware holding that, those floor joists in place are still performing the function they're intended to. Okay, Jennifer, this is a house that uh, recently had drywall installed. The difference between this and the last house we looked at is all of the structural elements are covered up. This wall is, uh, has some structural elements in it, but it also has a window. In an earthquake, the shape of this window opening may change slightly, and in fact, the window might actually break. But as long as the original shape is restored after an earthquake, it's probably okay. Okay, so these walls have to be straight. They have to go back to their original position and right. they're okay. Right. In an earthquake, uh, you would likely see cracking in the drywall because the drywall is a brittle finish. The framing elements will still be in place, but there might be a lot of cracking after an earthquake that you don't necessarily have to be concerned with. What I want to show you is what type of cracks you'd likely see. Over an opening like this, which is 
uh, structure, the structural elements are a beam over uh, a column on either side and what happens in an earthquake is that uh, rectangular shape is going to move one way or the other and when it moves in that back and forth fashion cracking occurs and what, what typically happens is people get very concerned about cracking over these type of openings and as long as after the earthquake the shape of this opening is basically the same there really is probably nothing to worry about. As long as there's no structural separation of the connections, uh, that cracking is just superficial in nature. How much am I looking for though? Because cracks can look big. How much of a separation is considered separation? Well, I would say anything over, say, an eighth of an inch. If you can stick a credit card in there, then that means there's some, some separation has occurred and it would be an area to be concerned with. I'm Dave Eirig, and on behalf of Jennifer Ann Wilson and myself, thanks for watching Ready for Disaster. For more information about being earthquake ready, please log on to FEMA.gov, cityofirvine.org, and shakeout.org.